Hi, welcome everybody. Um, welcome to Effective Communication in Research Environments. This is part of our Summer Virtual Enrichment Program High School Series. So I'm glad to see that you're here today. Um, even if I can't actually see you, um, I'm sad that we don't get to see you all on campus this summer, but I am glad that we get to still share some information with you. So as people are coming in, I just want to give you a little information. Um, I'll start with introducing myself. My name is Laura Marler. I'm a HiSTEP program coordinator. Um, HiSTEP is our high school summer uh, training and enrichment, uh, high school <laughs> scientific training and enrichment program. And um, it's a summer program that we would normally be holding now. Um, I work in the Office of Intramural Training and Education. And so I love to work with high school students and um, help them with uh, entering research environments. And um, I did my PhD in molecular biology and biochemistry, uh, and I did it here at the NIH in our graduate partnerships program. And so I'm excited to get to talk to you today. I wanna just spend a minute to orient you to this platform. If you haven't used GoToWebinar before, um, you should see a question box, and you guys can use that throughout if you have questions about the material, there are also going to be times when I'm going to ask you um, questions as we go, and you can uh, put your answers in there. And so right now, while we're getting started, maybe people can just uh, put into the question box where they're from. Where, where are you guys from? So I can kind of see um, where, where you are while we're going through this. Oh, yeah, I'm seeing some answers there. Florida, Buffalo, New York, Maine, Durham, North Carolina, Savannah, Silver Spring, close by. Um, Pennsylvania, Ohio. All right. Yeah, awesome. Thank you guys. People are from everywhere. So now you know how to use the question box. Um, and um, like I said, you can use it at any point. Uh, let us know. I Hopefully I'm not going to get to answer every single question um, since there are a lot of you on, but we will do our best to cover at least the major topics that you're asking about. And um, if we have to miss a few, then we apologize, um, but hopefully you'll get a lot of good information from this. Uh, my colleague, Kristen Zukowski, Dr. Z, is on this call. Uh, and so she may pop in from time to time. If there's a problem, then she's going to help me to fix it. And so don't be surprised if you hear her voice. Uh, Kristen, do you want to say hi? Hi everyone, it's Dr. C. Welcome. Glad you're here for our third Monday. Yeah, so she uh, she will be muted, but she's here um, to answer some questions as we go and to just help out. So um, just so that you guys know, um, if you do have problems hearing or um, the slides freeze, uh, chances are that that's going to be a connection issue on your end. And so I would suggest that you just go out and um, enter the webinar again and see if that fixes it. Um, if you do have a problem with hearing it uh, and you're uh, actually not able to continue for any, any connection reason, um, know that this is being recorded. And so the recording will be available. Um, and also the slides are in the handouts right now. So if you wanna download that file, then you can have the slides. They'll also be sent out to you later, okay? I know that some of you have questions about the certificate for this uh, high school series. So if you attend five out of the six sessions, then you're able to receive the certificate. Um, you need to log in to all five of those with the same name and email address so we know it's you. And um, if you miss a lecture and you wanna watch it later and you want it to count towards that certificate, make sure that you're logging in via uh, the GoToWebinar link. It's the same one that you use to register today. And so um, that way we'll see that you have watched that lecture. Um, if you watch it via YouTube, unfortunately we can't see that. So we can't count your attendance. And so that won't count towards your certificate. So if you're watching this on YouTube, pause it and go to the GoToWebinar link if you want it to count for your certificate. Um, okay, so if, uh, hopefully that makes that clear. Um, you guys can let me know if you have further questions, but hopefully this uh, this section is clear. So this is, uh, as Kristen said, this is week three of our summer virtual enrichment program for the high school series. And um, 
I'm going to talk today about communication. And so I'll start out with some interpersonal um, verbal communication. We'll talk a little bit about networking, introductions, and elevator speeches. If you don't know what that is, you're going to hear a lot about it, so don't worry. And um, then I'll talk a little bit about written communication and writing professional email. So you may notice what you don't see on here is giving scientific presentations or writing scientific papers. Um, if, uh, if that's what you're looking for, there are going to be other um, there are going to be other lectures on that during our summer series that you can find in the um, in the virtual summer curriculum. And so I have just put that in the chat. You guys can see it there to see everything that's happening. Um, but uh, today we're going to focus on some basics of verbal and written communication. Okay, so you can see this interchange in the cartoon here. Um, one character is saying, you need to make better your method of talking. And the other one says, um, do you mean I need to improve my communication skills? So I want you to remember as we talk about this, everything we're talking about today is communication. Ultimately, the goal is to be able to communicate well and to communicate clearly. And so um, where I introduce rules, they're only towards that end. Um, ultimately, you wanna be sure that you can communicate well. And so we're gonna start out talking about um, some interpersonal communication, specifically around networking. So what is networking? Um, does anybody have some ideas about what networking is that you wanna throw into the question box? Ah, someone asked, what do I mean by logging in? I apologize, uh, maybe that terminology isn't clear. It's registering for the webinar on GoToWebinar. So you wanna make sure you're using GoToWebinar and registering there. All right, so networking by one definition, the process of establishing links between people with the intent to promote communication for mutual benefit. You can see that's a quote by Dave Jensen here. But it sounds a little transactional, doesn't it? Um, I think. A lot of the time when we think of networking, we have some hesitance. It doesn't necessarily feel great. A lot of people don't. Think. But so I'm going to offer you an alternative definition. Ultimately, at the end of it, networking is about building relationships with others. And so remember that good relationships take time and effort. And your connections with people can be personal or professional. But in either case, you're building a relationship with that person. Now, this means that networks don't happen overnight. Uh, it also means that a lot of what we call networking that can feel kind of icky that um, just going to events and handing your resume to people isn't necessarily good networking. It's really about building relationships with people. And so why is networking something that's important? Well, it's important because people in your network can connect you to opportunities. Um, that, that can mean that they connect you to jobs or summer internships, but on some level you already know this because your network is already working to connect you to opportunities like new friends, new ideas, movie recommendations, book recommendations, right? Um, we derive benefits from having relationships with people, but that doesn't mean that it uh, has to be a transactional interaction, it's still a relationship. And so people in your network can share information and you can do the same for them. Remember that it's a two-way street. Um, you have something to offer as well. So how do you find people to network with? Well, these are all um, people that you may know or um, see around you that you may have the opportunity to network with. Uh, and you can uh, sort of divide up these groups of people uh, in a couple of ways. Here you see, um, the green boxes are sort of professional contacts, right? Your mentors, people you might meet at meetings or employers, collaborators, um, online sources, professional societies, and people that you might do informational interviews with. Um, if you don't know about informational interviews, that's where you basically ask someone, hey, can I take some of your time to learn about what you do? And also your class or lab mates fit into this category. Now. There are also um, personal contacts. 
your friends, the relatives of your friends, social groups that you have, relatives and friends of your relatives, your neighbors, and all of those people are also part of your network. Networks aren't only professional. So um, this is important because you can um, derive benefits, get information from all of these relationships, people that you already know. And so everyone has a network. When we talk about networking, it's really about expanding that network and also um, being aware of it. But you can also divide this, uh, these groups of people in a different way. So now we're looking at um, sort of spontaneous contacts those people that you are going to know anyway, without trying, you automatically will have some relationship, some level of relationship with your friends and your relatives, your neighbors, your mentors, people that you meet, um, your collaborators and your classmates or your lab mates. Um, and then the white boxes now are people that you might have to seek out. Your um, previous employers that you're no longer in touch with, those informational interviews that I mentioned, those are people you're seeking out to get information from. The relatives of friends, the friends of relatives, online sources, professional societies, and social groups. These are all connections that you seek out yourself. But something that um, I will tell you about spontaneous networking is that it's not truly spontaneous at all, not if it's done well, um, because ultimately you want to be prepared for these kinds of interactions. Um, I'm not saying you need to think like, oh, I need to be very prepared before I speak to my sister this afternoon. Um, but when you're thinking about networking, you want to know sort of what you want people to know about you. Um, what do you want to put forward? And so you can think about what information do I want to share with people? What do I want to learn? And time is short, especially when you're dealing with busy people, you may not get to talk to them for very long. So prioritize what's really important to you about that interaction. And be ready to take advantage of any situation. Uh, you never know when you might run into someone or have an opportunity to speak to someone. And so you want to be prepared for that. And this is why you need an elevator speech. And uh, I mentioned this term earlier. Here it is. We're gonna to get to exactly what that is. But before we do that, I wanna just back up a step and talk about some of the things. Um, if the elevator sp uh, speech is what you say, then we wanna think a little bit about how you say it. So these are basics like your body language and your posture. Uh, how confident do you seem? Do you appear friendly and open? And um, do you pay attention to how much you use your hands? while you talk. I am a person who does talk to my, talk with my hands to a certain extent, which you can't see today. Um, but be aware of that. You know, uh, you don't want to be distracting from your speech by having too much gesture. Um, and then think about what, how much you're moving while you talk. Um, you don't necessarily want to be a statue. Uh, you don't want to appear very rigid, but you don't want to be jittery and moving all over the place either. One thing I'll say on this point is that um, there's been quite a bit of research showing that um, mirroring a person that you're speaking to can really actually help to create a connection to them. And so you may want to pay attention to the body language of the person you're talking to. If they're leaning forward, then also leaning forward can really uh, bring across like, hey, I'm interested in what you're saying. Um, this thing that you're excited about, I'm excited about it too. And then you want to think about your voice. Think about your volume. Make sure you're not too soft or too loud that people can hear what you're saying. And think about your tone. You want, again, you want a friendly and open tone um, and one that's appropriate to the situation. And the inflections that you're using as well. And then finally, think about your eye contact. This is really important. Um, one of the primary ways that you can convey confidence is by using eye contact. It can also really help you form a connection with the person that you're speaking to. And so I, I recognize there's a little irony in saying that today. While I can't make eye contact with any of you, I wish that that were possible. But um, be aware of this when you're speaking with people, that these things do matter. 
And then I'll just share this. Um, you may have seen these statistics in the past, but this communication survey, which resulted in um, showing that body language is 55% of communication and tone of voice is around 38%. Now, I will say, like all science, there are caveats here. Uh, if you're really interested, you can look into the, um, the source, which is at the bottom there. Um, this is a controlled situation with a specific group of people, but the message is that your body language and your tone of voice are really important. They do really impact how people receive what you say. And I think you know this because if someone says, you know, if you say, how are you doing? And someone says, oh, I'm doing great today. Or they say, oh, I'm great today, right? In both cases, you feel a little skeptical about the fact that they're great today. So we know that body language and tone of voice matter, but it's important to remember it while you're speaking to someone. And when you think about body language, think about um, how you move, how you walk, how you approach a person, whether you're holding yourself tall, standing up straight, um, if you're using a handshake, whether that handshake is firm, uh, can actually have a big impact. Um, it's been shown that people with a firm handshake are more likely to get jobs. So in a potential future where we can shake hands again, uh, remember that. And in the meantime, of course, pay attention to the cultural norms of the time, right? So. Um, in the present, in a pandemic, uh, you would probably choose not to shake hands, but you might even call attention to it and say, oh, I would shake your hand. However, um, make sure you're making eye contact. Um, if someone approaches you to shake your hand while you're sitting, say at a meeting, make sure that you stand up. It's always best for both people to be on the same level while um, uh, during an introduction. And so either uh, both sitting or both standing, but generally it'll be both standing. Think about your gestures and movements and make sure you're showing enthusiasm. Uh, I think this is something that's so important, um, both in terms of your body language and your voice, is show that you're interested. Ultimately, that's something that is really going to generate interest in the other person and make them want to talk to you. And then if you're in a group, um, make sure that you're interacting with everyone. Try to make eye contact with everyone in the group. And be aware to avoid nervous habits. Now, I will confess this is one that I struggle with. Um, and so if you do as well, I will say that it takes practice uh, to overcome a nervous habit. Uh, knowing what you're going to say and having an idea of how to say it will really help you to kind of still your body and get rid of some of those nervous habits. And then again, pay attention to your voice, your tone of voice and your volume are also important. And so I would encourage you to practice this. Um, this may feel a little silly, but it's really important. This is something that you can improve. And so if you want to be good at um, meeting people and speaking with confidence, then Practice it in a mirror, practice it with a family member. And when you practice it, think about your posture. Pay attention to whether your shoulders are back and your head is up and whether you're standing upright. Think about your voice. Are you being loud enough? Does it sound like you're yelling? Do you sound excited? And think about your eye contact. And again, um, eye contact is really important. And if you're in a group, try to make eye contact with each person in that group. And so just imagine that you are arriving at the NIH campus. Now, hopefully for all of you, um, that will be the case in the future. I do hope that we'll be able to host you um, next summer and in the future. So um, when you do that, or you arrive at a lab somewhere else, if you don't end up coming to us, what's involved in meeting a scientist? Well, I'm gonna tell you a really important secret. All right, scientists, are people. Scientists are people. Introduce them to yourself and introduce yourself to them like you would introduce yourself to a person. You know, address them, introduce yourself, shake hands if appropriate, like we talked about, not during a pandemic. And also there are other situations where you might not shake hands, such as if the person is um, an Orthodox Jew or a Muslim person of the opposite sex or 
Um, even if you just get body language from them that says, mm, not going to shake your hand. But often in American society, we shake hands during an introduction. And then uh, when you're addressing a scientist that you're meeting for the first time, um, there are a number of ways that you could do that. You know, uh, I've used uh, our NIH director, Francis Collins, as an as a example here. So, hello, Dr. Collins. Good morning, Dr. Collins. Oh, aren't you Dr. Collins? Or simply Dr. Collins? Um, it's something you can think about. What are what are some greetings that work well for you? You know, obviously, hello, good morning, good afternoon. Um, and then as you think about introductions, you want to say both your first and last name. Uh, this is important um, because you want people to have a chance to remember who you are. And I would say that if you have a complicated name, consider giving a pause between your first and last name. I usually try to do that. Um, Laura Marler. And then include something meaningful about yourself. And this is really um, kind of a key that gives someone a chance to remember you. You know, there's a problem in the way we do introductions, which is we start with our name and the person has no context and nothing to tie that name to. And very often they forget it immediately. And if, if you're someone who struggles with names, you may have the same problem. Um, and so I think a, a lot of people who have trouble with names will say at the end of a conversation when they have some structure to, to anchor that name in their memory. Oh, remind me of your name, you know, before we walk away. Um, but you can help with that right at the beginning by including something meaningful about yourself. So I'm Laura Marler. I work in the OITE. Our office provides career and professional training to all NIH trainees on all NIH campuses. It's just a, a tidbit. Now you have a little more information, some context to put me into. And so, uh, we talked about shaking hands. When you do so, you know, smile, look the person in the eye. Um, generally, use your right hand and make sure that you're grasping that uh, scientist's hand firmly. Um, don't let the handshake go on for too long. Um, don't try to cripple them, right? This is not the moment to bring someone to their knees, but you don't want to be too loose either. And um, you want to make sure that it's a, a comfortable timing. So one, one to three times up and down and then let go. The components of an introduction. Um, uh, you want to address the higher ranking person first. So uh, if someone's introducing you, their present, or I'd like to introduce, you're more likely to be on that side of it early in your career. Um, if you're lucky to have good mentors who introduce you to people, then you may find yourself in this situation. Um, and they, they would then say the name of the person being introduced and a little information. So again, a little bit of context to help um, both give them something to tie that name to and to help start conversation. And so remember that first impressions are important. Um, often it only takes about six seconds for someone to form an impression of someone they're meeting. And first impressions do have a tendency to last. It's not that you can't overcome them, but they are important. And so uh, if you guys don't mind in the question box, as, as you look at this picture, tell me what you're seeing that, um, that these people are doing, that these two um, women are doing as they meet. What, what components of what we talked about What's happening here that looks good? Right, they're smiling, they're making eye contact, they're shaking hands, good eye contact. Yeah, they're standing up straight. They look friendly. Yeah, great. So yeah, a warm smile, a posture of confidence, and a firm handshake. It seems really simple, but it can go a long way. And then I've also said, you know, they're wearing business attire. Now that's not necessary for all situations. Honestly, the way they're dressed is pretty formal for most scientific contexts. Scientists tend to be a little more casual, but um, how you're dressed can, and how you look in general, can be a part of this. So you want to think about the details of how you're presenting yourself. Great, thank you, really nice. So now we've talked about how you're going to present yourself, 
but what are you actually going to say? And this is where the elevator speech comes in. So what is an elevator speech? I've been teasing you with this one. Here it is. An elevator speech is what you would tell someone about yourself in about the time it takes to go up or down six stories in an elevator. So that's generally less than 30 seconds, around 80 to 90 words. It's pretty short. And you want to think of it as a commercial for you. Now, when you're talking to someone busy, this is about as much time as you might get, unless you catch their interest. So you want to make sure that you're giving them context for who you are and that you're giving, like I said, this commercial for you. You're giving them something about you that's interesting that might make them want to learn more and talk to you more. So this is something you should develop and practice in advance. And you may need more than one. OK, in fact, you will need more than one for different situations. And so an elevator spit speech is a concise and carefully planned, well-practiced conversational description about what you do overall or what you're currently doing that your grandmother should be able to understand in the time it would take to ride up in an elevator. Okay, so there's a lot of pieces to that, right? It's concise, that means it's short, it's pretty brief, you don't have long. It's carefully planned. You've thought about it. You have put into this speech the thing that you want to be able to convey to the person that you're speaking to. And it's well practiced. Not only have you planned it, but you've taken the time to practice it and make sure that it sounds how you want. It's conversational, right? It's not stiffly formal. It shouldn't sound like you're reading off of a page. So it's a description about what you do overall or what you're currently doing. Um, we'll, we'll talk more about exactly what you might include in an elevator speech, but generally you want to get across you know, some context, context for yourself and what sorts of things you do, what, what you want this person to know about you. And then that your grandmother should be able to understand. Um, hopefully that's not insulting anyone's grandmother. Uh, I, but it means that a lay person should be able to understand this. So as you uh, progress in your chosen field, you will know a lot of jargon within that field, but all of that jargon should not go in your elevator speech. This is not a time to prove how smart you are. You want to make sure that you're communicating well and that the person that you're speaking to can understand everything you're saying. And then, of course, again, in the time it takes to ride up in an elevator, generally less than 30 seconds. So what would a good elevator speech be like? It should be interesting. It should be be memorable and succinct. It should be persuasive and clear. Well, start by thinking, what's your goal, right? This is going to change over time. Is your goal to get into a particular college? Is your goal to learn something from the person you're talking to? Is your goal to get a job? Um, this will change. And so your elevator speech will also change depending on your goal. And then what do you want the person to remember? Think about what makes you unique. And also, as with any communication, think about who your audience is. What's gonna be interesting to them? How will you make them wanna to talk to you and hear more about what you have to say? And then what are they gonna understand? Make sure that you're uh, uh, talking at the correct level. So, I would love if you guys would um, think about these as we go through. And you can write some things in the question box if you want to. How would your elevator speech be different if you were in building one at NIH? That is um, the building at NIH where the leadership offices are. Or if you were on a lab visit as a high school student, you know, you're getting to visit a lab for the first time. Or how about if you were on the metro? We all meet people on the metro. What might you say to them? Or uh, I would say one that comes up pretty often is, uh, well, maybe not during coronavirus, but in the past, um, a person is sitting next to you on an airplane. What, what would you say to them about what you do or who you are? You're at a barbecue in your neighborhood. 
How does that feel different? Or if you were looking for a job. And so I think you can see here that in different situations, you need elevator speeches that are different. Some of them are more formal than others. They have different goals. Um, in some cases, you just want to get to know someone. In other cases, you're job seeking. Um, and so you'll want to have a few elevator speeches that you've thought about and uh, know what you want to be included in those. So let's think about what your NIH elevator speech might include. Now, you guys, please uh, go ahead and type in the question box because I'd like you to think about this one. Um, what would you include in your elevator speech if you were an intern at NIH? What would you tell people when you saw them on campus and they said, oh, I'm so-and-so? You introduce yourself and then what might you say? Someone said, talk about your career and aspirations. Yeah, that's certainly possible. You might not start there, but that could be part of it. Your name, yes, very good. Definitely your name. What the internship you're in is. Yeah, great. It's, it's think about that giving them context. So your name, your position or program, um, now, these are some NIH specific ones. Uh, if you're in an internship here that you might think about your institute or center where you work within the organization um, and then the lab that you work in, your PI. And a two sentence description of your project. So um, this is if you're working in a lab at NIH, but um, there could be very different situations. So for you, what, what might an everyday elevator speech include? You can see some of what I said here, but I'm curious what you guys think. Okay, somebody said, introduce myself and speak about what I'm studying. What fields you're interested in, your grade, great. What I'm doing right now. Things that you desire to learn, I think that's a really good one. So you can see what, what I put here. Um, your name, that's non-negotiable. Your school, this depends on the context and who you're meeting, but it can be a good way to give someone some information. Um, maybe your year in school and what you're interested in. Or um, like, like someone said, it could be your career aspirations, something like that. So have a look at um, this, these two examples. So you can see the first one is pretty brief. I go to high school in Maryland, right? This is after your name, assume the name. Thing, but it doesn't give me a whole lot. And then have a look at the second one. This is an imaginary high school school in Montgomery County. I'm hoping to go to University of Maryland to major in biology. I want to learn more about molecular biology because I'm fascinated by the way that a few simple building blocks make up all of the life on Earth. How does that feel? It gives you a lot more information, right? It gives you a lot more detail, but it also conveys some excitement, some interest. You know, this is what I want to learn about, but here's why. Here's why it's really interesting to me. And I think that's something that you can think about including as well. Okay, so um, as you move on with your elevator speech, um, if you're able to uh, continue into a conversation, that's fantastic, right? Um, that's essentially the goal. You've started a conversation. So remember to show interest in the person that you're meeting. Ask questions about them, right? Um, what do they study? What are they interested in? And then listen. A lot of communication is listening. So don't forget that active listening, not just thinking of what you're going to say next, but really listening and asking good questions and showing interest are a huge part of conversation. And that's true in any context. Networking is building relationships, and building relationships requires interest, listening, 
and having a conversation that goes both ways. So your goal with an elevator speech is to generate a meaningful conversation. Uh, regardless of what your overall goal is, this is important. So if your goal is to meet people and get to know them, well, yeah, you need to have a meaningful conversation. If your goal is to uh, get a job, you still need to have a meaningful conversation to create a connection with a person that you can then build a relationship with. And that person may help you in completely unexpected ways in, in the future. Um, and so networking is really about building these relationships. And then this is important, figure out a way to disconnect, right? Um, you know that people are busy. You don't wanna take up too much of their time. Also, sometimes you're busy. You don't want them to take up too much of your time. Or, you know, not everyone has the information that you were hoping you would find. So know a way to leave the conversation. Um, I think often the most graceful way is to say, well, I don't wanna take up too much of your time. Thank you so much. But think about this. It's, it's important to also be able to end the conversation that you've begun. And there are some references here that you'll see in the slides when you um, receive them. But I wanna ask for questions at this point. Um, do people have some questions that they, I see you guys have tons of questions in the chat, uh, in the question box. So let me just have a look here. Do I have advice for an introvert who is shy on talking to new people? This is tough. I personally am an introvert and I understand that it can be really difficult. I think it's important to focus on the fact that this is about building relationship. It does not, you know, networking doesn't have to be going into a huge room of people and talking to 80% of them. Um, when you're an introvert, it means that you need time to sort of recharge after you have a social situation, after you deal with a social situation. And so you want to make sure that you give yourself that time. So right now, um, you know, if you're doing informational interviews, that could mean that you never schedule them back to back, that you give yourself time in between. It could mean that you do more preparation. Um, if you have a hard time coming up with questions in the moment, then maybe you make a list of questions for yourself. Um, same thing with your elevator speech, you know, preparing that and um, having some ideas of what you're gonna say before you go into the situation can really help if you are um, nervous and um, can really help you through those moments. So preparation and carving out time to recover afterwards. Um, and if you're at a... a conference or somewhere where you're around a lot of people, then that may mean taking some time uh, in between to go to... All right, what tips do you have to overcome the first obstacle of initiating a conversation without being flustered or nervous? Uh, I think that's similar. Again, I really think that preparation has a lot to do with it. And I think that we often are hesitant uh, to be prepared for these things. We feel like it's something we're supposed to be just able to do. Um, but if you've been going to Dr. Milgram's resilience workshops on Wednesdays, then you will know that um, we can improve in almost any area of our lives, right? We can have a growth mindset instead of a fixed mindset, and we can change how good we are at social situations or at meeting people. Um, and so preparation can play a big role in feeling less nervous. And the other thing is practice. Um, you just do it. And the more you do it, the more you see that it works out, that a lot of people are really nice and wanna talk to you and are really interesting. And um, so getting that practice in before you're in a situation where it feels like, oh, this is, I really need a job, can be really important. So find ways to practice before it's uh, absolutely necessary, before it's kind of thrust upon you. What's a good answer when someone asks, what are your goals in life? Huh. That is a big question. And I definitely recognize that 
at when you're in high school, you may not know the answer. And that is a perfectly fine answer. Um, I think the best answer to this question is the truth, as long as you also use a little interest with it, right? I don't know, totally fine. But maybe don't leave it there. Maybe I don't know, but I've thought about this and this other thing is interesting. Or answer with another question. I don't know. What, what did you do? How did you approach this when you were unsure about your goals? Then you can really learn something as well. So you know, remember your goal is a meaningful conversation. And that doesn't mean that you have to have all the answers. How do you approach the elevator pitch without making it awkward? Seems strange to inundate someone with all this info. Ah, so make sure it's conversational and remember it's really short, right? Um, you want it to seem natural. You want it to feel conversational. And I know that's weird when I just said practice, um, but practice with the goal of making it not awkward. Practice with the goal of making it feel natural when you say it. It's totally normal to tell someone something about yourself when you introduce yourself, right? Usually the first question someone asks is gonna be something along these lines. Oh, what do you do? Where do you go to school? What are you gonna do next, right? I mean, this is how conversation generally works. And so it's, uh, it's not strange to give some of that information. If you feel like you're inundating someone with information, chances are your elevator speech might be a little long. So think about cutting it down. You want it to be just one or two things. Um, and in all situations, it doesn't all have to go together, right? So you can feel this out. You don't have to walk up to someone and say, hi, I'm Laura Marler, I work in the OITE, this is what my office does. Um, but you could say all of that within the first few exchanges, you know, you want it to feel balanced. All right, should you provide ways for people you're networking with to contact you, or should you request a way to contact them in the future? This is something that I would play by ear. You wanna see how the conversation goes. I don't think that if someone seems like they're very busy or they're trying to walk away from you that you should um, yell your email address after them as they go. Uh, but if you have a good conversation with someone, then yes, it's absolutely a good idea to say, oh, I would love to talk to you more about this. You know, could I connect with you on LinkedIn? Could I give you my email address? Um, you know, might I send you an email to ask about that? When you've had a good conversation, a lot of times there is something you wanna follow up on. And so that can be a great way to generate uh, this sort of opportunity and to then share contact information. So good question. Yeah, good questions, thank you all. So we're gonna move on, um, but you can continue to ask questions in the chat if you'd like and I will take more questions at the end of the talk. So now we're gonna talk a little bit about writing professional email, some written Okay, so here's an example email. I want you to know what the relationship is between Joe and Sharon. Do you think they know each other? What might their relationship be? All right, I see a couple of people saying, you know, it seems like they've met before. Yeah, it seems very colloquial, right? And very familiar. But what if I told you that this is actually an email from a student who had in fact never met our director of the Office of Intramural Training and Education, Sharon Milgram, um, and hadn't spoken to her before? Does it feel a little too informal? Yeah, some people are saying it, it appears casual. It feels like an advisor-student relationship, right? Not, not a cold email. Yeah. So when you write an email, remember that not just the words that you write, but similar to when you're speaking to someone, your tone still conveys information. 
And so I want to say that, um, you know, there is email etiquette, but a lot of what we call etiquette is really communication. It's really about not jarring the person or disrupting their expectations. So if someone has never known you in the past, then you wouldn't write an email this familiar. And so let's talk a little bit about um, what the anatomy of an email is uh, before we move on. So we all have some familiar terms to turn back to. So when you write an email, there'll be a, a from line, that's you. The email's from you if you're writing it. Um, the, the to line is the person that you're sending the email to. Um, and this is the person who is the primary recipient of the information. And then there's also a line that says CC, right? It stands for carbon copy, which none of you remember. Um, but this is basically it's a copy of the email is going to be copied to this person. Now, this line is used for people who need to see the information that's in the email but are not the primary recipient of the email and then bcc or blind copy is for um, someone who is going to receive that information but the other people who receive it won't know that it was sent to this person so i'll give you an example um, if i'm writing to a student and I want someone else in my office to know that I've answered this student's question. Then the student would be on the to line. My colleague would be on the CC line, right? I'm, the answer isn't for them, but I want them to know that I've answered this, the question. Now, when I write a group of students and I don't want them to all receive each other's email addresses for privacy reasons, then I use BCC so that they all receive the information, but they can't see each other's emails. And then an email has a subject line, and then the body of the message, that's the email itself. And so I've just talked a little bit about the difference between to and CC. Um, basically, people in the to line are expected to act, or the information is primarily for them. And people in the CC line are um, just having that information shared with them. They're being kept in the loop, so to speak. And the message is just for their information. And so if you're writing an email to ask for something, then the person that you're asking would go into the to line. And anyone who just needs to witness that that happened, or you just want them to know that you're asking, would be in the CC line. Now, let's talk about the purpose of a subject line in an email. The subject line is first and foremost, before the email has been read, that's all that the uh, person you're sending the email to is going to see, right? And so part of the goal of the subject line is to get the recipient to open the message. Especially if you're cold emailing someone, um, this is what they know about you at that moment. Uh, and so you want it to convey what you're gonna in the message. And then also potentially to get the recipient to do what you want if you're asking for something, which of course they won't do if they don't read the email. It's to help you and the recipient find the message later. So using an informative subject line can help uh, if you need to search for that email at a later time. And it's really to make life easier for the recipient. It helps them decide whether to open your message. It helps them find it later. It helps them know what your message is about. And so you want to use a subject line that's informative and that tells what you're asking for. And so here's an example. Um, a subject line could be OITE account. It doesn't tell me a whole lot. Or it could be request for help with OITE guest account. So now I know someone has a guest account on our OITE website and they need help with it. So it sort of told me what the email is gonna be about. 
And so what do you think about these subject lines? Now, uh, we're gonna get mixed up if I ask you to respond to all of these. So I'm just gonna ask you to respond to one of them. Let's see. How about reminder? Summer events for July 14th and 15th. What do you guys think? Why is that a good or a bad subject line? Someone says it's not very specific. That's true. It tells it's specific in terms of dates, but it's not specific in terms of uh, topics. So I think it might it might depend um, who you're sending this to. But uh, reminder, name of event, July 14th and 15th might be better. Yeah. So maybe more specific. Someone says it is straight to the point. It's not rude. Ah, it's not good because what's the reminder? Well, presumably the reminder is about the events, but you're right, they still haven't told us what the event is. And so what, what I'd like to get across is that when you write an email subject line, think about your reader. Um, ask yourself, just take an extra minute and ask yourself when they see this subject line, will it convey the information that I want it to convey? Will they know what the email's about? Okay. Oh, so some guidelines for subjects, keep them short and make them specific, um, make the specific point of the email clear. So sometimes it can feel like these two things are in are a contradiction, right? You're saying keep it short, but you want me to say what the email is about. Um, but put some thought into how you can concisely convey the the point of the email in your subject line. And then in the body of your email message, you want to include a greeting and then whatever the content is that you want to um, convey and have a polite closing. And so we're going to talk about each of those components. What are some possible greetings that you might use in an email? I see some questions about college email. Yes, I will get to those. Yeah, you might say, uh, dear, very common. Um, using a colon is very formal. Probably not needed in most situations, but in business situations, you might use a colon. Often you would use a comma, dear recipient, comma, dear Dr. Marler, comma. Now. Here's a note, if you're deciding whether to use doctor or not for a name, um, you know, if you're interacting with um, scientists at the NIH, they may have a doctorate and you may not always know. Uh, I would say if it's important email and you know, you're taking up this person's time to send this, then take a minute of your time to try and find out, just uh, do a quick search, find out if they, are in fact uh, MD or PhD or otherwise have a doctor. If you don't have time or you aren't able to find out, I often err on this, I'm not gonna offend anyone. Um, I've never had anyone get angry with me so far for saying doctor when they in fact were not. Um, so these are options. Um, a lot of times you'll see hi as a greeting. I would never start the first email this way, um, but you know, hi, hello, good morning, good evening, greetings, to whom it may concern if you don't know who the person is. Now, again, try to use a little of your time to find out who they are. But um, if you have tried and you really can't figure out um, to whom it may concern is still very general, you might be able to at least make it a little more specific Dear admissions committee, for example, um, dear fellowship committee, dear such and such scholarship committee. These are all options. Um, and then when you have a response from someone, I would say that just as mirroring can be useful in um, oral communication, it can be useful in written communication. 
And so when someone writes you back, then you get to see how formal they are. Now, they're gonna be less formal than you because they're often in a position of more power. However, I think it is okay to follow their lead. And um, same thing with deciding whether to use Dr. Marler or Lara, for instance. If someone ends their email with their first name, or certainly if they say, oh, please call me Lara, then it's okay in the future to do that. Um, but generally you wanna start out more formal and then look for cues from their reply. And then using a signature block is kind of another way of giving some context about yourself, right? Uh, if someone has questions that they just wanna know, you know, who is this person? Or they wanna know how to contact you later. The signature block is a good way of getting that across. And this is very common in professional um, situations. So I've included mine here. This is my real signature block. Uh, so it has my name and my degree. Um, this C actually indicates that I'm a contractor. It has my title. It has the office that I work in at NIH, my building address, my email address. It would have my phone number, but um, my office phone number is in the office where I am not, so I've taken it out for now. And um, then it has my pronouns at the bottom here, she or hers. And so I made up an imaginary um, summer intern, so you can see what a summer intern um, signature block might look like. And then finally, we get to the message content. So much um, thought goes into an email that isn't necessarily even the content of the message. But here we are, the actual content. So one of the biggest things with email is you wanna keep it short. Make it simple for the person who's reading it. Be nice to your reader. And so put the most important information in the first sentence if you can, right? If they read one sentence, it's probably gonna be that one. So try to get it up there at the top. That said, remember that your tone is important. So you might wanna consider beginning with something pleasant. Um, try to address one important issue per email. This is because uh, otherwise you may lose people. If you absolutely have to include two important questions in one email, then let the person know in the subject line. Two questions about, for example. And then think about how it looks. People are gonna be reading your email on a screen, so try to limit it to the length of one screen. Honestly, shorter would probably be better. And create short paragraphs, give their eyes a break. Um, if you write your email with the email window stretched all the way out, so that it looks like three lines to you, but the person is receiving it in sort of a more usual sized um, email inbox, then it may look overwhelming. So keep that in mind, try to have short paragraphs. And then um, if the email includes an explicit request, like I said, put it in early, get it in at the very beginning of the email and put it on a line by itself so that they know you're at. for something. Another thing I'll say is that um, make sure it is actually a requirement and we worry about being polite, which is important, but we then bury our request to such a degree that someone can't tell it's a request. So make sure that you've included, could you meet with me, right? Say you're asking for a meeting, could you meet with me? Could you send me some dates that would work? Or are you available on Thursday? You know, if there's no question, then it's possible you haven't made your request explicit. And then afterwards, what are some polite closings? What do you guys think are polite closings for an email? You can type those in the question box. Thank you is a common one. Yep. Thank you. Thanks. Sincerely. Mm hmm best regards, best by itself. Yeah, 
So here are several. Um, now these get less formal as they go down, right? So sincerely, probably the most formal or best regards. Um, definitely you can use best by itself, um, but I think it is a little less formal. It can even sound a little flip. Um, I use it a lot with people that I already know. Yeah, fondly, thank you in advance if you're asking for something. Maybe a little confident, thank you. Thank you for your time is a really nice one. Yeah, good. Um, enjoy your weekend or enjoy your afternoon. Um, and then things like chow or cheers. This is someone you know, right? This is pretty familiar, pretty casual. So lots of different closings and it's important to just tune it to the situation and um, the kind of email that you're hoping to write, the tone that you wanna achieve. And so um, we're not gonna do this in pairs, but I will say um, you guys have my email address in, in my signature there. And when you receive the slides, you'll have my email address. So if you would like to do an assignment of practicing writing an email, then uh, I would be happy to look at it. And it's an opportunity for you to practice asking for some information or just um, writing a professional email. Okay, so here's a couple of examples. So um, this is a Joe student writing to three doctors, Dr. A, Dr. B, and Dr. C. Now, what do you guys think about this uh, subject line? What does it already tell you about the email? It tells you that there'll be three questions, right? And it tells you what the questions will be about, applying to the summer internship program. So it's pretty specific. And it tells me I better look out for three questions, not stop reading after one or two. And then here's something that I think is useful. So he's used, uh, Joe Student has used Dear as his uh, opening. He's addressed all three of the recipients. And now he said, could you please help me with the following questions? So a polite tone, uh, it's clear. It has the request right in the first sentence. And then the th questions are bulleted, which means it's pretty easy on my eyes and it's pretty easy for me to see that there are three questions and where they start. So this is a, a pretty nicely structured email as an example. In this case, if Dr. B were to reply, to Joe the student and say, uh, answer one of these questions or all three of these questions, then would, would Dr. B reply with, um, would he re reply or reply all? What do you guys think? So reply would mean that the email would go only to Joe the student. Reply all would mean that that email would go to Joe and Dr. A and Dr. C. Okay, someone says reply and CC the other doctors. Yeah, that's, that's a nice answer. Uh, I see some others reply all. I'm, I'm getting some of both. Well, I'll, I'll tell you. Um, I think that reply all or as, as reply and CC the other two would be very appropriate. And, and why, would, why would Dr. B see these other two doctors? It's because that way they know that the questions have been addressed, right? It's to let Dr. A and Dr. C know, oh, I took care of this, you don't have to reply. And so you use reply all in a situation where um, everyone who's on the email needs the information that you're sending or maybe doesn't need the answers to the questions but needs to know that you've answered the questions. This was done. And yes, a lot of people are saying CC the other two and that is absolutely appropriate. Great. So how about this one? If Dr. Z sent an email about the high school communication workshop. And so you can see here the subject, 
is communication workshop handouts. And she's saying, oh, if you didn't get the handout, then please let me know. I'll send it to you via email. So in this case, if you were to reply to Dr. Z to ask for the, uh, the, for the handout, would you reply or reply all? Yeah, now people are saying reply and I'm getting some, um, a few that say specifically, do not repeat, do not reply to everyone. Yeah, right. Only reply to Dr. Z because not every person registered for this workshop needs to see that you need the handout. Right? That's not information that they need, nor do they need to know that you've sent it. So I'm seeing some stronger replies in this case saying not to everyone, just to Dr. Z. Um, and, and that's absolutely right. You only want to reply in a case like this to the person who sent the email. So reply, but not reply all. Great. A few other considerations. Be mindful about naming attachments when you use them in emails. Make sure that the attachment is named something professional. Um, nothing silly, nothing inappropriate. Also make sure that it's meaningful, that the person who receives that is going to know what to expect in the attachment. And I will caution you, if you are sending a CV, uh, a resume, a personal statement, and you have named it personal statement or resume, it will look the same as every other resume or CV that they uh, receive. So again, think about the person who's receiving it and include your name um, or some something that will meaningful, meaningfully identify that that's your resume or CV. Um, generally speaking, reserve using the urgent option on emails for messages that are truly urgent. Don't send unnecessary email because everyone gets a lot of email already and respond quickly when you can. So um, try to be responsible for your email. A few other considerations. Um, don't use all capital letters. Um, it's unless you're intending to do it uh, and don't do it too much, um, especially in uh, professional emails, it's really not called for. Um, generally, you would not use colored text, but if you are using colored text for a specific reason, make sure you're doing it intentionally, like for headings, for instance. And don't use fancy backgrounds. Don't Basically, don't make it hard on the eyes. All right, so here's a final example. You guys have a look at this email, um, which is uh, not a specific email that I have received, but pretty typical of emails that I sometimes receive. And tell me what, uh, what you see about it that might be good or might be bad. Okay, the subject line is unclear. Yes, am I able? Not, not very specific, not a great subject line. Someone says there are problems with the grammar. Yes. It's very helpful uh, to reread your emails before you send them. Also, most email programs will include a, a grammar program of some sort that will actually flag problems for you, um, as well as spelling. So it doesn't hurt to double check your grammar and your spelling. It's not signed, correct. Subject doesn't match the body. Yeah, well, the subject is just not very clear. Yeah, right. Um, so all of you, I can't say none of you said it. Ah, right, they got my name wrong. Um, actually, my name is Laura. So um, that's an easy one to double check, right? Double and triple check names and the spelling of the name of the person you're writing to. Usually not great to get their name wrong. And then also, I would say one of the big problems with this email is that they, besides not knowing my name, they have not done any research into who I am. This person does not know that I don't have a lab and that I do not take postdocs. Um, I work in a training office. And so I, I use this example to demonstrate 
several problems, right? Having a clear subject, um, getting the name correct, rereading, checking your grammar and your spelling, but also think about who you're writing to and um, make sure that you have done a little work to try and reach the correct person for answering your question or for giving you the information that you're seeking. Um, in general, people are happy to help you, but it really helps when you show that you've done a little bit of your homework first. All right, and so that's the end of the information I wanted to share today. So I'd be happy to take some more questions. Um, let me have a look at some of these. So I know that several of you were asking about specifically about college emails um, and sending emails to colleges. Uh, here's one. Would you suggest having an email block as a college student? Oh, a signature block, or is it excessive? Um, I would say that it's generally not necessary, but it can, uh, the signature block can just uh, serve to give people some information about you, right? I mean, if you're emailing them, obviously they have your email address, but if you want them to have other contact information, it can be useful to include it below your name. Sometimes it's a little more elegant than trying to put it all in the um, body of the email. How would you greet a teacher in email? Um, so this depends on the on your relationship with the teacher and on the teacher. So um, uh, I think dear is always a, a good fallback if you're not sure. Um, I would say default to being a bit more formal until you see that it's not uh, that maybe they respond in a different way. Um, and then depending on the um, teacher and the degrees that they have, you would decide whether to use um, doctor, Ms., Mr., um, or another title. All right. Is it appropriate to ask someone, what may I call you? Absolutely. Um, in fact, I think it's great to ask if you're not sure. Um, in an email, it can be a bit awkward because you sort of need to start out with something. Um, but in person, this works really well to say, oh, may I call you Dr. So-and-so, right? Give them the chance to tell you what to call them. Uh, it's also great for pronunciations because then you hear the person say the name themselves. Um, over email, a little more complicated. And unless there's a reason that you're really unsure, I would probably just choose something and go with it. If I asked multiple questions in an email and the recipient only responded to one or never responded at all, how long should I wait before sending an update? Yeah, this can depend a little bit on the situation. Um, in academia, I think, I, so personally, I usually will follow up after a week, um, but it depends if it's really time sensitive and I need the information right away, then maybe I need to follow up after a day. Um, generally, I would, not follow up sooner than you know one to three days unless there's you know it's an absolute emergency um but i think a, if someone hasn't replied to you within a week it's absolutely reasonable to follow up and and you can say that hey i'm following up just wanted to make sure you saw my email reiterate the part of the question you need if they've replied and answered one of your questions or part of your question then that gives you an opening right away, right? So you can how much for this information, I was also wondering this. While maintaining an engaging tone to request an internship or research opportunities. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I don't think there's anything uh, antithetical about uh, being professional and being engaging. Those two things can absolutely go together. So professional really just means um, you're being appropriate to the situation. And so being engaging often is about demonstrating your interest, um, finding a way to connect to that person and what they're interested in. 
And so um, that can mean doing a little bit of your homework, knowing what they work on or you know what, what may be their interest. Um, and it can mean really demonstrating passion in your own interests. Uh, I think both of those things can be very engaging. And generally, when someone is passionate about something or speaks with genuine interest about something, that is interesting to the people around them and it is engaging. So um, really what that means is be honest about those things you're interested in because it comes across when you have that genuine interest. When you can't find someone's title, so doctor, mister, et cetera, um, what should you write? For instance, if you did research on a person you're emailing, but it's still ambiguous. Yeah, so um, as I said, I would probably, it, it depends on the situation. Um, if that person, so if you're writing someone at the NIH and you know that that person has a lab or works in a lab and um, is not currently a student, then it can be a, a pretty good guess that they would have a doctorate of some sort. And I think in that sort of a situation, it's better to default to doctor. Um, it's better to err on that side because ultimately I don't think that's gonna bother them um, even if you're wrong versus the opposite where you might um, not use the title doctor and someone does have a doctorate. However, um, in you know, writing someone on college admissions, um, if you can't find out, it may be less likely. So, you know, in certain situations, um, maybe you just default to Mr. or Mrs. I will say um, when you use Mr. or Mrs., it means you have to know the gender. So it introduces one more potential complication. Um, and so it depends on what you know about the person and the context. But if you think that it's likely uh, and you just can't confirm that they have a doctorate, it's fine to just uh, default to that. I, I don't think that's likely to offend someone. Should you include a quote in your email signature? You, you may, you can, some people do that. Um, it's not required, but if there's something that you like, just keep in mind that this is something that people are seeing when you send an email. Um, and so you don't want it to be, um, well, you certainly want it to be professional um, and you don't want it to be anything that's specific or requires context that people aren't gonna understand. Um, because remember, this is going in every email you send out um, if you have it set to be attached to your email. And so um, just make sure that any quote you include is something that you are, proud for people to see um, and that, you know, that it is professional. Can an informational interview be done via email? This is possible, but probably difficult um, because ultimately, if when you do an informational interview, you wanna be able to get as much information from the person as possible about the sort of job they do, what's it like, um, how did they get there, and it's gonna end up being a lot of questions. So over email, it may seem very tedious. Uh, if you can't schedule a phone, a quick phone call, you know, 15 minutes to get to talk to someone, then I would just, um, but they do respond to email, then I would just limit it to one or two questions. Just really cut it down from what you might be able to get from an informational interview. And that's okay, you know, uh, some people are really busy and you'll get more information from some people than others, but uh, I would just cut it down. One or two questions in an email, not try to go through a whole informational interview and then move on to possibly when is it appropriate to address someone by their first name? And what if I was replying to a teacher who responded with their first name? Yeah, this is something that I think is challenging, um, especially when you're starting out in your career and um, especially when there's a power differential, right? So 
I think if you have a concern, then you can just continue to default to Dr. Mr. Mrs. whatever title um, and, and until or unless someone says to you, oh, please call me by my first name. Um, you can just default to, you know, Dr. Z, for instance. Um, if they do tell you, oh, call me my, by my first name, then it's fine, go ahead. Um, if someone consistently replies by uh, signing with their first name and you are in a situation where other people in your same uh, sort of stature also call them by their first name. So for instance, if you're in a lab um, as an intern and the PI goes by their first name within the lab and everyone in the lab calls them by their first name, then it's okay to use the first name. Um, still probably not the first time, <laughs> but over time, if you see that like, oh, this person goes by their first name, then that's okay. You can also ask. That's, an, that's a situation where it's okay to ask. How do you email admissions committees? Yeah, great question. Um, so while it's a great question, it doesn't have all of the information, right? So it depends on what information you want, what you're emailing for, what's the goal of your email. But all of these same things apply. When you email, you want to make sure you're using a polite tone, um, use appropriate subject line that's clear and that's specific to what you're asking. Make sure that you use a um, appropriate greeting and an appropriate closing. And then within the body of your email, keep it short, keep it simple, keep it straightforward. Get, get the question that, or whatever information you want, um, get it in early. Okay. When you're finding research positions, how many cold emails should you send to different faculty members? Oh, um, I would say send a first email. If someone doesn't reply to you, follow up once, again, about a week later. And then um, if they still haven't replied, you could, if you really love their research and you really think they're busy, you could follow up one more time. And after that, let it go. Um, don't follow up more than twice. Just, okay, that person's not, not available, not interested. Maybe they're just too busy to mentor right now. So let that go. So um, I guess the answer is you would send as, as many cold emails as you ultimately need to to find the person who responds uh, and has time to talk and that you feel like you have a um, mutual interest. How do you avoid being overly annoying with uh, emailing a professional, i.e. too many questions in one email or having multiple email encounters? Right. Um, I think that there is a tendency to assume that we're being annoying when sometimes we are not. Uh, so it's okay to send an email and ask for something but you make a good point. Um, you don't want to bombard someone with questions. You don't want to assume that they will give their time to help you with something. And you don't want to um, just continue to email them over and over if you aren't receiving a response. So I would say, think about your tone, right? And not only being friendly and um, cordial, but also, make sure that you demonstrate that you've thought about the fact that this is someone who's busy and that um, you appreciate that they're spending time to reply to your email to help you with and um, don't ask more than one or two questions in a given email unless they're very succinct and the person has help you um, but even then, don't overdo it, right? Just just a couple of questions and wait to see how they respond. Like I said, if they don't respond at all and you followed up once or twice, then let it go. Don't keep emailing. Um, 
if they do respond and they sound helpful, then it might be at that point, you know, that's an opening to say, oh, thank you so much for this information. I was also wondering about this and to ask further question. Um, I would say don't overdo that either unless they're in a mentoring situation for you. So, you know, you might want to ask, oh, I have several more questions. Would it be okay to set up a phone call? Could we have a virtual meeting? Or would you mind if I ask you about some other things? So you kind of put the ball in their court a little bit, give them the opportunity to um, let you know if they're too busy. Uh, I wouldn't go on and on if someone has helped you a lot unless they've expressed a willingness to do so. That said, some people are really happy to help and you will find those people. So don't be hesitant to at least ask the first time. Ah, someone says, if I'm emailing for the first time, would you recommend giving a short elevator speech to preface the content of the email? And this is a very thoughtful approach. So I appreciate you asking the question. Um, it is important to give someone enough context to understand what you're asking. And so that might mean letting them know your level in school or what you're working on, what your interest is. You don't, I wouldn't say that you have to give your elevator speech as we talked about it earlier, because again, you wanna keep it pretty brief in an email. Um, elevator speech should already be brief, but this might be even briefer. So um, think about what you're asking for and think about what they need to know to answer it or to understand your question and then just give them the context that they need. I will say uh, as a caveat to that, if the goal of your email is not to get information or get the person to do something, but it is to form a connection, then I would go more towards the side of including an elevator speech. So think about the goal of your email. Uh, as a rule of thumb, when finding research positions, oh, oh, we did that one, I'm sorry. Does the time that an email is sent matter? Does it reflect poorly to send an email late at night? Huh. Um, this depends on the recipient, right? I think uh, it doesn't really matter, um, but it may matter to some people. I will say that there's a brilliant trick in most email programs. You can just schedule an email to be sent. And so if you're concerned about um, something like that, just you can schedule it to go out at 8 a.m. Um, however, what does matter is whether someone will read it. And so I would say um, sending email first thing in the morning or um, first thing after lunch can be much more likely to be read than an email late on a Friday afternoon, an email that arrives over a weekend might not be seen as readily. And so if someone is very busy and is receiving a lot of email, that might have an impact. Um, I don't know if you have to worry about that too much with a first email, but if you don't receive a response and then you're thinking about sending a follow-up, that can be a really good time to think, okay, when did I send the last email? Well, what if I try this time a different time or uh, a weekday if it was a weekend, something like that. So it can have an impact in that way. Will it seem rude to ask to record an informational interview or take notes on it? Um, I think it is absolutely not rude to, to take notes during an informational interview. The point of an informational interview is for you to get information. And if you don't retain that information, then um, there's much less of a point. So I think that someone who's agreed to an informational interview will generally also expect that you take notes um, and appreciate the information that they're giving you. That said, it is very good to ask. Um, now that we're uh, in a situation where most informational interviews will be um, done on a virtual platform, at least for now, then um, there is the option to record. Uh, I don't think it's necessarily rude to ask, but it is definitely required to add respect whatever the interviewer uh, response. 
how can one be confident in general? Wow, great question. Um, yeah, don't we all want to know? Um, I can tell you how to appear more confident. Uh, some of the things we've talked about, standing up straight, making eye contact, speaking at a good volume. How to be more confident comes down to some of the other things we've talked about. Thinking about preparation so that you don't have to worry as much about um, mm, what will I do if this situation arises. Having some uh, prepared pieces that you can use in certain situations. Or um, also practice. Practice and the knowledge that you can improve with, um, with any given situation and with confidence. So ultimately um, just trying out some of these situations and getting more used to them will change your confidence. If you're not successful getting into a research opportunity as a high school student, what would you recommend for URMs? That is an acronym I'm not familiar with. Um, would you mind telling me? Underrepresented minority. Ah, thank you. Underrepresented. Mm. So if you're not successful getting into a research opportunity as a high school student, what would I recommend? Ah, um, I would recommend seeking um, resources and seeking people who can help you with uh, both finding the resources that you need and preparing for those opportunities in the future. And so um, our office is one place where you can find resources like that. Very likely your school has an office where you can find resources and where there are people who could help you with um, preparing applications, with looking for opportunities. Um, so seek help. Uh, early and often um, and be prepared to receive feedback and respond to it, right? So again, this is something that you can improve. Um, you need honest feedback about your application and how to make it better. And so seek that out, um, whether that's at a counseling office at your school or a contact through a summer program, um, reaching out to someone who can look at your application materials and give you good, honest feedback about them. That's a perfect place to end, Dr. Myler. Thank you so much. Wonderful. Well, thank you, Dr. Z, for your help. Thank you to all of you for being here and for your great questions. Um, it was really great to see you and get to talk to you. You can always follow up with more questions uh, if you have them and um, practice your professional emails. So, um, I hope that you have a good rest of your afternoon, a good rest of your summer, and I hope that we get to see you at NIH in the future.